a fish, a fishy. Ooh. All right. Ralph here. Well, I wanted to talk this week uh, about something I've talked about before and something I want to talk about a lot because it's food and I love food. We love to eat it. We love to cook it. At the very least you, you eat things. One question we often get in reenactment from the public is, well what did Vikings eat? Short answer, Vikings ate food. We know they had access to grains, and barley mostly, I believe, uh, wheat, rye in the east. But what did they, they would have eaten what was local and what they had. So I've said many times before, we say Viking, or even Norse or Scandinavian, it's really the Nordic countries. Things grow in different areas, even in the state I'm in. Things grow differently in different parts of the state, so they would have eaten different things based on what was locally available. Of course, up until fairly recently, that's the way it was. Even in your, your green grocer would have had what was local, what was seasonal at the time. It's a modern phenomenon to get a tomato in January or strawberries year-round. They would have eaten what was seasonal and what was available. When I was younger, I used to be a purist about certain things. Growing up, you know, in an Italian-American culture, macaroni was always semolina flour. I actually watched a, a cooking show a while back, and it kind of changed my mind. I, I thought that's what you had to make macaroni out of. I thought macaroni was always semolina. Watched someone make it out of white flour. Tried it, it tastes similar. And the point they were making on the show is what I'd like to make today, cook with what you have. Just, just like, you know, back in the day, things aren't available everywhere. You know, we're lucky in the town I'm in, we got a lot of different grocery stores. Uh, almost all those grocery stores have, I always call it the hippie aisle. Maybe the organic section, the, the, you know, a lot of different things available there. You can get your gluten-free flours. A lot of older flours are gluten-free. Hazelnut flour is something we know. They had hazelnuts. We assume they had hazelnut flour. Barley and barley flour you can find in these aisles. You don't have to search out and say, well, I can't make those delicious looking flatbreads that Ralph makes because I don't have barley flour. I made them this week out of white flour. The point being, you could still make them. They still taste good. They're still fine. If it's what you have, use it. Of course, on a budget, barley flour is expensive. Hazelnut flour is expensive. I think last time we cooked, I used an almond flour because it was a decent substitute for hazelnut flour. It's what I had. It stuff's expensive. White flour and flax meal looks kind of like barley flour, believe it or not. Uh, So you cook with what you have. This week we did, all the, all the recipes are still inspired by an early meal. We have a habit of reading through, we love reading cookbooks. We read through a whole cookbook and then take ideas and kind of make them our own and just cook stuff because following something directly is like difficult and stuff. So these are inspired by an early meal. The recipe was for simmered mackerel. We didn't have mackerel. We actually happen to have trout. We bought some trout, so we use trout. Trout, of course, much more available up here in, in the northeast of the United States. Trout's everywhere. It's, so we had rainbow trout. That's what we used. Follow the recipe similar. Uh, we've talked about substitutions before. You know, not everyone, if you can't get green onion or you can't get um, various things, you substitute them. We couldn't get lingonberries, we use cranberries. If you can't get hazelnut flour, try almond flour. Or again, white flour works fine. Now a Viking on campaign. If they're used to eating herring where they are, they hit England and they don't got herring, they're gonna cook whatever they catch anyway, right? They're gonna use what they find. If they find a sack of flour, they're gonna go, well, I can't make bread out of this. This isn't the barley flour I'm used to. This is some other flour. They're not gonna throw it out. They're still gonna use it. An interesting reenactorism that I've come across throughout the years is trying to do things to period. That's not just saying, well, 
they only had this, so we're only going to use this. So we're, we're not going to have this feast because we don't have the mackerel and we want to make simmered mackerel. That, that is one concern. The other concern being the, the assumptions made that the ancient world all the way through the Vikings that they didn't have seasonings and they, they had herbs. They could make things taste good. There's this weird misconception that keeps popping up that, oh, they, they would only use seasoning on something or salt on something if it's gone bad and they didn't want people to know. How stupid is that? You still wouldn't eat bad food. You didn't want to, you didn't just throw extra pepper on it and say, well, they'll eat it anyway, because they knew fairly early on in, in the history of humans that bad food makes you sick. They had to write into very sumptuary laws for religions, because maybe, maybe it was just a way of spreading the knowledge of don't eat bad food, but they did it. They knew it was bad. They wouldn't add pepper to it and feed it to people, unless they didn't like them. I mean, if you got a bunch of prisoners you don't give two shits about, yeah. Then I don't think you'd even add the pepper. You'd just say, eat it and go fuck yourself. So we know they had herbs. They grew wild. I mean, that's something, another thing that, that people have trouble wrapping their minds around is foraging would have been a big thing. Foraging for herbs, you know, you're not foraging for salt, but, you know, you go out, you find your your green onions, your wild onions growing, garlic grass, see if it smells good, tastes good. You're going to pick it, you're going to forage it, do find some wild onions. You know, you might pick as many as you can and save a few and plant them in your own little garden. So that now you're cultivating onions, you're cultivating herbs, you're cultivating different things that you know you want to use and like. It's just kind of, it's one of those things if you take a second to think about, makes sense. And saying that they didn't have any seasoning doesn't make sense. Or, oh, only the rich would have had salt. They didn't have access to salt. Yeah, they, they generally lived on coastlines next to salt water. They figured out salt. You have herbs, you have seasonings. You have, well, they have cardamom sitting in their spice cupboard now. Spice cupboards, that's a modern thing. They would have used mostly fresh. Of course, you pick, we know they had dill. We grew dill this year. If you, you know, at the end of the season, you pull out your dill plant and hang it up in your house. It'll dry, and then you'll have dried dill all winter. That's again, it, it's you take a second to think about it, and you can figure it out. You don't have to use the most period ingredients when when cooking at a reenactor event. You still make it taste good. I mean, that's that's a big thing. Get creative with it big part of creativity is being creative with your food you know they, they might not have necessarily had mustard seed but if you want to use a, a mustard seed blend seasoning in our video we we fry up some pork chops because we had them and they're good we know they, they ate pork they ate pig did I you know go forage for some wild onion and dill and, and pat them in and no I went to my spice cupboard and I had a savory French mustard seasoning from Auntie Arwin's and I put that on there and cooked them and they were goddamn delicious. And I've, I've cooked most of my life, I've enjoyed it, I, I always love doing it. Wrapping my head around fire cooking is a little easier because it's, it's just a different heat source for me. And learning to control the heat source is a challenge, not necessarily how to put crap in a pan. If you're starting out, Figure out how to put crap in a pan. It's, it's not that difficult. Use the seasonings you're used to. Use the food you're used to. You got big into the, the craze. I don't know if it's still a thing. Everyone was making pizza on their grill. It was a huge thing years ago. It probably still is. If you know how to do that and you like doing that, try that over the fire. If you like grilling, I mean, that's a huge thing. Everyone loves grilling. You fire up the grill, you're doing a rack of ribs, try doing a rack of ribs over the fire. Put a grate on the fire, see what happens. You might burn the shit out of your ribs, you might figure it out better. Get a general idea, just make an easy, slower transition into some fire cooking. Especially at events, uh, demos, or just in general when you're camping. You, you come to find out it's easier to keep the coals going in the fire pit and cook over there than to try to turn on your camp stove all the time. You save money on propane, you got the firewood anyway, because you're going to have a fire, you might as well cook something over it, right? That's not to say that camp stoves don't have their place. 
My wife says, we'll, we'll pry the camp stove from her cold, dead hands. Just making breakfast over the fire can be a bit of a pain in the ass. I don't think we'll ever be at the point in our reenactor careers that we want to light the fire pit and make coffee in the morning. We just want our damn coffee. We can't light a fire until we've had our coffee, so, you know, that doesn't help anybody. We were focusing on the fish, fish, seafood. Vikings like to inhabit a lot of islands, the Norwegians especially. Again, Danes took England, the Swedes went uh, farther east, ended up in Russia. Norway went, well, what do we get? I don't know, you have Ireland. Those guys are nuts. Well, it worked out for them in a way because there's a bunch of islands and whatnot in between, and they got to take over some islands and, and winter over there, some great launching points for some great raids. Well, islands are islands. There's a lot of seafood, a lot of fish. They got their hands on cockles, mussels, lots of fish, squid. I believe they had squid. I only assume they ate an otter or two, maybe a seal. I mean, otters are cute, but I'd, I'd eat one of those. I don't know if that's a thing. Recipe was for simmered mackerel. We did simmered trout and steamed mussels. And like I said, we also had some pork and some beef. We got to use our squirrel cooker. Big shout out to Alfer who actually made our squirrel cooker. That's that's just a name, they call him squirrel cooker. I mean, you could cook a squirrel on there. We did, we cooked our steak on there. And it came out good, I think. You'll see, you'll like it, or you won't. Skull! Chieftain Ralph here. We're outside doing some more cooking. I got some helpers back there. Of course, I have my lovely wife with me, Nanan, and we're going to be doing some cooking today. We're doing, once again, from an early meal. We're doing the recipe's simmered mackerel. One of the important things about cooking in a very Viking tradition is cooking what you have and what's local. Because, you know, you're going somewhere, you're going to cook what they got, you're not going to bring everything with you. We don't have mackerel, we have trout up where we are. Trout is plentiful, so that's what we're doing. So the recipe calls for cleaning your trout and cutting it into bits and pieces. So we're going to do that. We're also going to have some steamed mussels going later. We're going to do our flatbreads again and various nibbly bits. Sounds delicious to me. Sounds delicious. All right. Why don't I get started? Ooh. All right. So cleaning our fish, you see a lot of people that go behind the gill. Actually, there's a hard bone here, right by, right in front of the gill. So I find with trout, I don't know what kind of trout these are. Rainbow. They don't look very rainbowy. I don't know, rainbow trout. So I usually kind of go right along that line, usually. I started doing this this morning. We usually cook these whole. The recipe calls for cutting them up. So I figured this out this morning. We have some already prepared. Oh yeah, doing a bang up jet. I did was doing good until the camera started rolling. And then all bets are off. Alrighty, Get the head. Fish heads, fish heads. You want to save those? You can always make a nice stock out of them uh, for whatever your fishy stock needs may be. So I'm also going to clean off the fins here such as it is and what I can clean off. So you want to find the bones if you can. Not just clip the fins. I've seen people do it with scissors clipping the fins. I'm actually leaving the back on because that shouldn't fall off in the simmering stage. I say shouldn't. I don't know. We don't try these recipes ahead of time. A lot of people, they'll, they'll do a video and they, they've cooked it 50 million times and then they show you the good one. and We don't do that. We just wing it. We don't know what we're doing. Cut off the tail. There we go. Now you want to cut them into, I forget what the recipe says, I actually just cut them into fourths, so a couple inch pieces. Um, you can split them in half down the middle, but that bone's actually going to be easier to pick out later that way. So, I'm not going to. Thing is tough. There we go. And you get about four pieces per fish. Now to simmer our fish, we have our water boiling. The recipe calls two to three liters of water. The, the important thing, you want it just enough to cover the fish. So we're using two liters of water and a can of beer. The recipe calls for vinegar and beer. It sounded more fun. So we're gonna flavor that with some of our green onion here. 
And then we're going to take some of our dill. These are all fresh out of our garden. And we're going to throw that in the pot first while it's on the fire. Come on over. Just going to toss that right in there. All right, now this is a simmered fish, not a boiled fish. So we're going to actually pull this off the, wall, the fire. And then we're going to put our fish in and let it sit for a good while until the fish and cook is cooked. Great thing about fish, it generally doesn't take very long. This is the great thing about S hooks that are twisted is the top is usually not hot. Let's try to pull that off. Alrighty. Alright, let's get our fishy fish. Go back to swimming, my little friends. Yow! Yeah, boiling water's hot. I don't know if we knew that. Huh? I learned something today. Funny enough. Now you know. There we go. Fish bits. Sit in the water. And simmer. Simmer down now. The recipe actually calls for this to be served cold. We're not going to let it sit quite that long. We're going to let it sit, cook, simmer. Uh, and then scoop it out and move on with some of our other recipes. So, uh, we'll get back to you. So we're going to make some of our flatbreads. We've done a few of them. I believe in a previous video we made them out of almond flour mm -hmm. that we had. Uh, we know they had hazelnut flour. More common would be a barley flour. Um, this is actually sifted all-purpose white flour. So I wanted to show you, you can make these things out of whatever you have. That's kind of our running theme, I guess, it's turning into. Using what you have. It'll still look good, they'll still taste good. You don't have to look for the most period ingredients. To help these look a little better and taste better and be a little healthier, um, I have flaxseed meal in here, which you can find in most health food stores. It, it makes them look better, makes them taste better, packed with the protein and everything else. Uh, they're more likely to have that than your barley flour or other things. And if you have a food grinder, you can grind your own flour, but that's another video. So, there's three cups all-purpose white flour sifted, about three tablespoons of flaxseed meal. And yeah, let me show you how we do them. So first, I'm going to kind of mix that in together. So stir it around with a stick. Stir it around with a stick. It's like making beer. So we're just going to add our water gradually and stir it as we go and get the consistency we want. I want to point out quick, obviously this isn't a period pitcher. We know they had pitchers and various things. What's what's the thing they're always... Soapstone? Soapstone. They had Soapstone. ceramics. Soapstone. Well, yeah, they had ceramics, right? Yeah. Ceramics, glass, obviously, and soapstone. But if you got a camp or an encampment, go with what you can get. Thrift stores are good for, for clay pitchers and the whatnots. You know, hide your bottles and everything. Use pitchers. It just looks better. Mm. So we're going to add a little. We put it to good use. Yeah, yeah. And then you just work it in from the sides. So you're looking for a consistency of... I guess a little drier than pizza dough is kind of what you're going for. You don't want it too wet and sticky. You don't want it too dry. That's not very descriptive, is it? To be, I don't know, because saying pie dough isn't super helpful either, but... If you have peanut butter, you've gone too far? Yeah. Yeah? That's a good way to put it. If you hit peanut butter, you've gone too far. They make better flatbreads than we do. Because they, you know... Well, you do. Yeah, you can flavor, you can use honey to make them sweet, you can add, you know, optional salt, uh, herbs. What herbs would they have had? They had dill, you know, they would dill, add dill. They had uh, wild garlic, you could add any sort of greens, really. I know I've seen them made with um, nettles. So celery root? Uh, celery seed, uh, angelica. Oh. oh, yeah, angelica. Yeah. I've seen that written down in words before. Or versatile, just the little flatbread. Yeah, they did have risen bread. A lot of people, they, they, they think a lot of reenactors do only the flatbreads because they're different and unique and interesting. It's also harder to do risen bread. It is, it is more difficult. 
All right, down to hand-to-hand -hand combat here. Flatbreads don't take much. No. Well, especially on campaign and traveling. Yeah. You bring a little sack of flour, throw some river water in it, and you're off to the races. And you have to knead your bread with love. Yes. Or hate, I suppose. It depends on how it's going. Sometimes it's going great, and you're kneading it with love. Sometimes it's not coming together quite right, and it's hate. I touch too much water. Oh, no. Now we're kneading with hate. Alrighty, so that's about what you're looking for. So we let our, our dough rest a little bit and the gluten relax a little bit. So it's going to be a little easier to work with. A lot of times you'd want to use a floured surface. You want to get a, I don't know what you call it, a plum sized dough ball going. Tear it off. I got cheat codes turned on. I'm using parchment paper. This this is a lifesaver. If, if you can bring a roll of it to camp with you, it's great shit. So. I throw it in the middle of my parchment paper, you press down kind of into a flat disc. I'm going to flip over my parchment here. I got a bowl. Um, you can roll this out with an actual rolling pin. Wine bottles work good, full wine bottles. This kind of helps us keep a certain diameter going. I'm going to rotate occasionally. Flip it over. Give it a good press down. Give your butt wiggle. There you go. You can make them as thick or as thin as you like. Uh, it's going to affect cooking time. The thinner it is, the, the quicker they'll toast or fry, depending on how you want to cook them. Why am I using a corner of this? I have this giant sheet of parchment paper. Eh. Chief did not smart. That's a decent thickness. We'll go with that. And uh, that's all you do it. You do that 50 or 60 more times, and then you get cooking. see you, you're not sneaky. We put our fish stock water back on to boil. I added some garlic scapes for a little extra flavor and let them soften in the boiling water for a few minutes. Now that's come out pretty good, um, I'm going to add some of our fresh herbs. I've got some green onions and some dill. Oops. Oh. Sacrifice that one. I am going to put in our mussels. Make sure that you soak your mussels in fresh water before you put them right in your pot because they will give off a bunch of dirt and grime. We're gonna throw these in. They'll only take a few moments and then you'll know they're done when they pop open. If they do not, do not eat it. Do it the easy way. See you.
Either way, like, comment, subscribe, follow me on Instagram at Ralph of Hamilton. I'm on Instagram, post up some uh, good pictures of all their shenanigans and whatnot. Like, comment, subscribe, especially comment. I always say, I like hearing from people. Leave me a comment. Talk to you later. Keep it up.